Welcome everyone to this evening's One Book Belgrade virtual tie-in event, proudly brought to you by the Belgrade Community Library, the guide's guide to reading the rivers. One Book Belgrade presentations are free and open to the public, thanks to generous sponsorship by Kenyon Noble Lumber and Hardware. If you have questions about this event or other One Book Belgrade events, or our adult winter reading program happening now at the library, let me know and I will answer them. Uh, attendees to this presentation will be entered to win one of our many winter reading prizes since this is a winter reading event. And those include gift certificates and book packs from the country bookshelf, local Belgrade restaurant gift cards, and actually two fly fishing trips with Gallatin River guides, one two person full day float trip and one two hour two person walk wade fly fishing trip and those drawings will happen on April 1st. My name is Sarah Creech and I am the adult services librarian at the Belgrade Community Library. And before I introduce our presenter, I have a few tips uh, for Zoom to get the, the most out of your experience. All attendee video and microphones are muted and turned off for the presentation or disabled for the presentation. Questions will be taken using uh, two functions tonight, the chat function, as well as the raise hand feature. If you'd like to ask a question live with your voice, you can click the raise hand button. I'll unmute you or allow you to talk if uh, it fits in with the flow of the conversation uh, that's being discussed. And then you'll ask your question. And once you get your answer and confirm, we'll uh, re-mute you. And if you'd rather ask your question via chat, I will be monitoring the chat and taking those questions um, interrupting our presenter uh, in a few different ways and um, keep it going. So either way is totally acceptable. It depends on your level of uh, enthusiasm for the subject and if you want to share a story yourself. Uh, the chat is also the best way to let me know if you're having any technology issues. To use the chat, you're going to click the speech bubble at the bottom of your screen and it will open on the right side of your screen if you're not in full screen mode. If you are, it'll appear in a window. You can kind of drag around the screen by clicking and dragging the top bar. To type your message, first open that chat and click on the text that says type message here. Start typing and your message should appear where that type message here text was. And to send, press enter or return. To use the raise hand feature, click the hand shaped button labeled raise hand. Um, I'll see that in the participants list that I have and uh, I'll interrupt our presenter and unmute you. And once you ask your question, you can lower your hand um, unless you have another one <laughs> or I will lower it, lower it for you. Uh, as you can see, this event is being recorded. And if you need them, closed captions are available. So um there's going to be the chat then the raise hand and then there's a cc for closed captions if you want to okay. use them or show them hover over the arrow uh, or click the arrow next to that cc for closed captions and click show subtitle and they should show up sorry at the bottom of our of your screen and it is from an artificial intelligence software so it might not be perfect and then finally, please, please take a minute to complete the survey that will pop up once this event ends. It's really short. It kind of asks you just for your thoughts and um, if you liked it or didn't. And um, it helps us, the library and the sponsors know um, what you thought and it helps us improve every time. So, and since we can't see your faces, it helps us know if you enjoyed the event. So tonight's presenter is the owner and outfitter of Gallatin River Guides located in Big Sky, Montana. His passion for fly fishing started at an early age in Michigan and eventually brought him to Montana to start his career as a professional fishing guide. After eight years on the water, he became an outfitter and the owner of Gallatin River Guides, the Montana Fishing Guide School and the Montana Women's Fly Fishing School. His experience and knowledge as a professional fly fishing guide have helped him assemble and employ one of the strongest rosters of guides in the industry. When not on the river or in the fly shop, he enjoys spending time with his family, including his four-year-old daughter. Please give a warm, albeit silent, welcome to our presenter, Mike Donaldson. 
And it's my pleasure to turn it over to you, Mike. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a great introduction um, and kind of uh, told me, told everyone a, a little bit about my background and, and how, I, how I got here. Um, my roles have been reversed the last couple of years. I, I used to get to spend every day out on the water, get to go fishing. And um, now I've, I'm in a whole new world and I'm learning a lot of new things, which has been awesome. It's been a lot of fun. Um, Hopefully today I can use what I learned over those over the, all those years of being out on the river um, to kind of to kind of help you folks uh, here today with kind of fishing and, and reading water. And as we were kind of getting this presentation together, it, we kind of struggled with how we wanted to kind of um, convey this information and how to break it down in a way where we thought was going to be kind of easy to understand as well as um, coherent, if you will. There's, there's so many things that go into fishing and trout fishing and reading water and just trying to figure out uh, what's going on in a given day. And so the one, the one way or what we landed on how to do this is to basically break it down. And I'm going to go to our first slide here is to kind of break this whole thing down by the rivers being fished. And what we did is we basically focused on the three main rivers in our area or the three main rivers that Gallatin River Guides kind of focuses on. And that is the Gallatin, Madison and the Yellowstone River. And we're gonna break each one of those rivers down by, a, by the season, meaning winter, spring, summer and fall, as well as, and then we're gonna, and then as, as we kind of go through those seasons and in those in those rivers, we're going to kind of start to get into the technical aspects of, of, of what guides are looking for on that particular river during that particular time frame. And a ton of it is, is a lot of it can be very difficult to actually explain because a lot of it just comes with experience and it comes with kind of knowledge and, and guides themselves begin to kind of get into this, into this groove or this mode where we're out on the, out on the river and it's, it's just kind of coming naturally. And, and you're also, you know, using past experiences and, and using all these different things that you've learned to kind of make it happen or make it work on that particular day, right? But a lot of it does come down to some, some technical things or some very kind of straightforward things. Um, and so again, that's, that's kind of how we've broken this down. I hope it's not too kind of rambly and too confusing. And I hope it Kind of makes sense as we're starting to go through these. Um, so the first season that we're gonna that we're gonna do, we're gonna do winter because um, we've kind of started where we're at right now, and hopefully we can kind of use some of this information for folks to go out and start fishing um, right away and have a better understanding of what's going on in the rivers. So the first river that we're gonna go over uh, for winter is the Gallatin. Um, great winter fishery. Uh, there's certain stretches and there's certain sections of this river that that we fish year round um, and all through the winter and even on on colder days or or days when most folks aren't even thinking about going on in the river. A lot of times we have guides out there and the guides are working and the guides are catching fish and locals up here in Big Sky um, fish it quite regularly through the winter as well. So the first thing that we'll talk about. Um, for the Gallatin in the winter is kind of the different uh, bugs that you're going to see out on the water. And there's not very many out there um, throughout the winter. Your main three, your main one for sure is going to be your midges. And then we do have some mayflies and stuff like that that will hatch through the dead of winter, but mostly start hatching and kind of moving around in that, you know, late February and through March and April type of thing. And then we do have some very small stoneflies that like to hatch as well. Flies on the Gallatin during the winter don't necessarily matter as much. We're not necessarily trying to match what the fish are eating or trying to look around and try and figure out exactly what's going on. A lot of times we're just trying to kind of pick a pattern or two and it more comes down to the water that we're typing, the, the type of water that we're trying to fish. Um, oops, why am I like going forward? And then here we go. Um, in the winter on all these rivers, but in the Gallatin especially, the type of water that we're looking for are the deep, slow pools. And that's where these fish are potted up at. They are, 
for lack of a better term, almost in a hibernation mode. They're just kind of hanging out, getting through the winter. They don't have a ton of energy. They don't have a ton of, um, you know, need to really be moving around a whole heck of a lot. The, the water's cold um, and they're just kind of hanging out in there. They will feed and they will feed very well in, in the winter, um, but it's a matter of us kind of finding those fish. And we focus on, on the big pools in the river the deeper, darker pools, and we're going to start at the very bottom of that pool, and we're going to work our way up through. And especially in the winter, these the trout are all are potted up. We like to think that they're going to be sitting in very specific groups through that pool. So we may start at the bottom of that pool, and as we start nymphing our way up through it, um, not catching very much. And we like to tell folks that come into the shop, or even our clients that are out on the water. The second we get a bite or we catch a fish, we're going to use that information and say, hey, I think there's a bunch more fish in here and I'm going to continue to fish right in this little area and we'll continue to work up through. And a lot of times you'll, you'll catch another fish or, and then maybe another one. And, and as we move you know, from, from below river to up river through that pool, suddenly we'll stop, we'll stop catching them. And if you don't want to move or you want to go back through, what we can do is kind of go back to the, the bottom of the pool where we started or where we started to catch fish and kind of start over. And the idea would be if you're going to do that or as you move up through that pot of fish is to kind of switch flies as you're coming through. Um, a lot of times if we can kind of uh, switch flies and kind of keep showing them different types of things and, and, and have them not be as, as uh, used to those same flies coming through, they'll continue to feed for us. They don't have a ton of food supply in the winter, so they are somewhat apt to eat the things that come through. They're not going to move very far for those flies. So we have to kind of be very thorough as we move up through those pools and not be super fast and just kind of uh, adjust our depth or adjust our weight and just kind of probe our way through there. And again, you're looking for that. Um, you know, that kind of pot of fish. And once we find them, there's, there typically tends to be an aha moment of here we go. I'm on them. Um, I've kind of, I've kind of located where these fish are sitting. They won't want to be in any type of fast water um, or anything like that, or typically near the banks. They're going to sit down in those pools, especially on a kind of like a normal winter day. The one thing that we will see in the winter is weather wise, we can see them as it starts to warm up or you do get those sunny days, they move, they may, those fish may move up into the head of the pools where it's a little bit shallower and a little bit quicker or down through the um, bottom part of the pool where again, the water is kind of the same way. But for the most part, they're, they're typically not gonna be moving around in the river very much and they're not gonna, they're not gonna leave those pools um, very much on a regular basis, or at least enough to where we're almost wasting our time if we're, if we're going to, you know, kind of try and probe around to different parts of the river and, and see if for some reason they're sitting in a, in a couple feet of water. It's just really not, it's just really not likely to happen. One of the great things about fishing in the winter, and we're going to talk about the opposite Part of this in the summer is that not a lot of people are fishing in the winter. Um, so a lot of these fish aren't seeing fishermen and it's, it's a really neat thing. One thing that a trick that the guides use, especially on the Gallatin in the winter, is trying to locate where other local fishermen have been at. And we use the snow and we use the turnouts and stuff like that to kind of try and, and see, oh, there's a very well-traveled path here. Or there's fresh tracks in the snow. I know somebody was just here within the last day or two. Um, that's a really great way for us to maybe hike up river or hike down river or get in a vehicle and, you know, relocate into another spot or another area where we feel like it hasn't been fished as heavily. The Gallatin in the winter can be a little tricky. Those turnouts can have a lot of snow, especially the way it's snowing right now and as we get deeper into winter. Um, and so our local fishermen and the guides themselves will tend to concentrate on, on some of the same spots over and over again. And that can 
not be the best thing for us to do, right? And they'll kind of run on spots or local fishermen will run on spots. So we have the ability and the wherewithal to know, hey, somebody's just been here or I'm, I'm willing to kind of work a little bit to go up a uh, river through the snow, down river through the snow, um, we can be much more beneficial. Uh, overall, Gallatin is, is a great fishery in the winter. It's a ton of fun. I found that um, it's one of my favorite times to get out on the river because there's not a lot of people around. You feel like you have the entire um, river to yourself and not a lot of folks realize it, but it can, on, and especially on certain days, fish really, really well. So the next uh, river that we'll focus on in the winter is the Madison, and it, it is somewhat similar uh, to the Gallatin and what we're looking at. The flies itself are, are very, very similar. You've got you know, the, your main three, your midges, your betas, which is that bluing olive that we kind of talked about, and then your small stone flies as we come into the spring. Um, the Madison itself won't when we do look at flies, there's some main patterns that we're going to use. One is that Pat's rubber legs pattern. Um, and then we're going to kind of stick to the tried and true midge larvas, midge dries, and um, our, our mayfly nymphs, as well as our mayfly dries. The one really neat thing about the Madison in the winter is it does have, uh, it can have really great dry fly fishing. And it's typically always going to be midge fishing. And those, those midges will typically be hatching in behind the rocks uh, in, in, in the shallow pools near the edge of the river. And uh, for the most part, you're gonna start the day kind of nymphing, kind of looking at it like that, and then kind of waiting to see if you can see some fish rising. It, it is a really, really neat experience. Well, we're gonna read the Madison uh, River in the winter, looking for fish or looking where for these fish are gonna be holding. It's going to be very, very similar to kind of how we're looking at at the um, at the Gallatin. Again, these the fish themselves are are typically in kind of a, a very sluggish kind of hibernation mode. They'll they'll still feed for us, and they do need to feed for us, um, but they're not going to move very far for that food source, and they're not going to they're certainly not going to need to eat as much with that cold water. So they're gonna they're gonna once again be sitting in water that's not pushing very hard on them and it's not making them work very hard, but still has some current where that food source um, can come through. The Madison itself is, is a very swift river. It's a very fast river, especially out in, in the middle channel um, where, the main, where the main flows of water are coming through, which for a fisherman is actually very beneficial, especially um, when we're looking for that slower water, because for the most part, the the kind of pools and the seams and the pockets are going to be towards the shoreline. And we can see in this photo here on our, if we're looking upriver on our left-hand side, um, these gravel bars and these, in these bigger rocks are, are where these fish are going to be holding and hanging out because that's breaking up the current and that's allowing them to just kind of, kind of hang out um, again, kind of waiting for a food source and, and waiting for, um, uh, warmer water really before they need to move around yet still getting some oxygen and stuff like that. Very similar um, in regards to kind of the Gallatin, the Madison River when we're fishing it in the winter we're always fishing it on foot and there are kind of less access points and, and more people in the same area. So the more that we're willing to kind of work and the more they're willing that we're kind of move upstream or downstream away from these kind of main access points and kind of be aware of those tracks and those trails in the snow, more often than not, the better we're going to do. Um, especially when there's a lot of snow on the ground, people tend to not move super far from, um, you know, wherever they parked or, or wherever these kind of main access points are, which for us up in this area coming around is that Reynolds Bridge and that $3 bridge area. Um, which are really neat and, and they're great areas. And um, a lot of times we're gonna do really, really well or better if we can kind of get off the beaten path. And maybe it means using a gravel bar to get out into the river a little bit further or just walking upstream and downstream away from uh, where the pressure of the fishermen are at. Um, over the years, especially the last five years or so, it's gotten more and more popular to fish the Madison in the winter. I can remember a long time ago when 
we would go over there and there was typically no one ever there. All right, so the next river that we're gonna talk about is the Yellowstone River. Um, the Yellowstone in the river, in the, I'm sorry, the Yellowstone River in the winter itself is, is a, a bit of an enigma in that it just, it does not get fished very much. It certainly does not get fished very much by guides. Um, the Yellowstone is more of a, a float fishing river. Obviously there, for folks that live over there in that Livingston area or up in the valley, um, they have some access points by foot and and they're going to be fishing it but in terms of a one of those spots where we think about hey let's go let's do some fishing today the yellowstone especially um you know december january february is not one um that we kind of think about it's not till a little bit later into the springtime when the ice and snow is kind of melted off and we can start to put boats in the river and start to float the river Yellowstone itself is, is, a, is a large river. It's best fish uh, out of a boat type of thing. Um, flies are very similar, kind of generic flies for the Yellowstone in the winter. Uh, we're going to kind of go and stick with kind of our, you know, kind of our, our tried and true, our classic nymph patterns, our pheasant tail, our, our prince nymphs, our Pat's rubber legs, which is a stonefly pattern. Um, Again, a lot of it in the winter is not pattern dependent. We're not, for the most part, trying to trying to uh, match what whatever is hatching or the fish are being super picky for some reason today. For the most part, it, it's more about trying to find the fish and um, present the flies well and, and get them down to where they're at and trying to get them to eat. Um, if we were to be fishing, the Yellowstone and the river were very, very similar. Fish are in, you know, slow water pools. They're just kind of hanging out, um, trying to get through the winter, uh, waiting for warmer water, waiting for different insects to start hatching in different parts of the river where they're going to want to move around. So those are, it's kind of the, just of that season in terms of, of winter. Um, here we go, Gallatin in the spring. This is when things kind of really start to pick up. A lot of times the Gallatin will be um, in runoff as we kind of come in through that uh, April and May timeframe, which most folks don't realize. Locals uh, have started to get more aware of it. Um, the Gallatin can and will fish very, very well during runoff. We just need to know our spots and we need to know what we're looking for. Um, it can it, it can actually be the one of the best, if not the best times of the year to be fishing. Um, and we're gonna kind of go through how we're gonna go about doing that. During that spring time, as water temperatures warm up, we're gonna start to see a lot of our bugs hatching and we're gonna start to see these fish coming out of their kind of uh, winter slumber, if you will. This is the time of the year where we're gonna really start to see active fish. We're gonna see fish feeding heavily and um, with, with less pressure as well. The kind of main, main flies and the main insects that we're gonna see hatch during this winter time is gonna be our stone flies, our caddis flies, midges are still hatching, as well as our blooming dollop, which is a mayfly. You guys see worms up there. Uh, there's worms really don't hatch. So there's typically not a lot of uh, worms in the river. Most times of the year, they do get washed into the river or washed out of the banks during runoff because that water's so high and it's eroding some of those banks. Um, and it's a little trick uh, that we'll use during high water. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we come forward. Some of the favorites uh, for this time of the year are uh, in terms of actual patterns. Uh, are, here's your um, Keller's hot worm here. Um, this TJ hooker, which is a kind of a, a stonefly uh, streamer type pattern. The guides really, really like this in the, in the, um, uh, during this runoff time frame, and then if we do see some bugs hatching, um, it's typically going to be a, a caddis dry, elk care caddis uh, is one of the kind of go-to. Now, during runoff, especially on the Gallatin, we see the we see the water flows come up really, really high, and we see them start to push really high into the banks, and they actually, in certain areas um, of the river, start to overflow the banks. And what we're going to see, how we read this uh, as fishing guides or as fishermen to find where these fish are at, 
is actually in these really, really um, kind of slow parts of the river away from that main channel where the water is literally coming up over the bank. These fish are not going to sit out in the center of that water. It's just pushing way too hard. They cannot, they cannot just sustain that, that type of water flow pushing, pushing them around. So this is the benefit of fishing during runoff is we know when we find that area or that break in the river or, or, or where it's kind of coming up over the banks and these fish can move into there, where essentially all the trout in that area are going to be sitting right in that slow little, little bit of water, kind of similar to when we fish in the winter where the fish are, are potted up as well, they're potted up even more during high water. Um, it can be absolutely phenomenal. We can see, and if anyone's ever watched runoff, it's quite crazy. The, the clarity of the water is um, quite, quite markish. And to our eyes, it, it doesn't look, look like the fish can, can see our flies or are going to be able to really do anything in terms of um, finding any, any food source or anything like that. It's, it's quite amazing. You fish run off enough how much you realize these fish can see things, um, especially these bigger flies. If I go back a slide, like a fly like this TJ hooker or a large Pat's rubber legs. And this is why we use this, uh, these worm patterns uh, a little bit bigger. And essentially what they're seeing is the silhouette. We have theories that these fish know runoffs happening and they know it's going to be a long uh, kind of period and they know that they're going to have to eat when they get the chance and, and therefore when they see these silhouettes and they see these things coming through that they're actually just going to kind of be probing at it or grabbing at them um, trying to figure out if it's food or not which can be really beneficial for us um, because they're not being as picky we can use a lot of just kind of random flies and if we're fishing the right type of water and we're kind of again presenting those flies well or, or well enough for this scenario um, we're going to get some bites and we're going to get some um, some action in there. We get a lot of folks that come into town, they see the river and they don't think it's fishable. And, and if you've got the kind of knowledge of what's going on in in the, you know, the, the sense of adventure to get out there and kind of try it and probe around and try and see what's going on, people find that they can be a lot more successful um, fishing during runoff than they initially would have thought. I, I moved here, you know, uh, 11 or so years ago. And when I first saw it, I, I was like, wow, that's unbelievable. There's no way we could catch a fish in there. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it. And the more you realize, essentially, even at peak flows, um, a good fisherman or a good guide can get out on the Gallatin River and kind of find these, these areas. Um, they're oftentimes they're very small. They're, they're obvious, but they're very small. And kind of nymph your way through there um, and, and, and catch fish because they're all clustered into that area. As we get into warmer weather, we're going to start to see more people. That's obviously going to affect um, what's, what's going on on the water. It's not going to affect runoff quite as much um, as it does in the summer, but we're going to kind of, um, we're going to kind of, kind of get to that as we kind of move forward. Um, the next, uh, next thing we'll talk about is kind of Madison River in the spring. Um, the Madison River is not affected nearly as much as uh, a river like the Gallatin is during runoff because the Madison is technically a tailwater and it is a tailwater. It's controlled by two dams and they will, especially during that springtime when all that snow's melting, those dam operators will hold that water back and they're trying to fill those lakes up, Hebgen Lake and Earthquake Lake up to a point where they're comfortable with the water levels to sustain the river throughout the remainder of the year. Um, the Madison will get affected by runoff. We'll see it come up. We'll see it come up somewhat high, um, but it will fish very, very well during that time frame, And it is somewhat similar to the Gallatin is those fish kind of push themselves um, towards the banks and into those overflow areas where they can get out of that main river channel. Um, but I would say the Madison, 
at high water is a little bit easier to read or, or easier to find those quite obvious spots where those um, fish are going to be holding just because of um, the fact that there's not as much water coming through there that they're holding water back type of thing. Flies during that time frame that we're going to see are somewhat similar in our kind of spring runoff or our spring fishing. It's going to be a, a, can be a very kind of bug activity type of time frame, mainly stone flies, uh, maybe mainly that betus mayfly or that blue winged olive. And then you're going to have your caddis start to hatch kind of pre summer type of thing. And then similar to the gallots, you've got your midges and then your worm patterns. Um, a lot of the patterns that we're going to use on the, on the, I'm sorry, on the Madison during that time frame um, is that San Juan worm there, um, caddis nymphs, because they're starting to uh, hatch and move around in the bottom of the river, and then our blue-winged olive or our kind of mayfly emerges, our mayfly nymphs. Um, as we're kind of cruising forward, here's kind of a, just a, uh, just kind of a recap of what we were talking about as, as that water starts to rise, those fish are going to move in towards those banks, um, into those seams, those buckets, into those pockets, really anywhere where we're not, um, they are not feeling that water push too hard on them. They can kind of hang out and, and not use too much energy yet still have. Um, water for oxygen as, as, as well as moving water for as a food source. So um, the next, uh, oh, go ahead. We do have a question from Tim. I love it. Um, and I think it's specifically about the Madison, Tim. You can uh, chat if I'm misunderstanding the timing of your question. But do you fish egg patterns for the spawning rainbows during this time? We do. And we kind of skipped awesome. over that. Uh, no, that's okay. That's okay. Yes, we do. And that's a great, that's a that's a great uh, kind of mindset and that's a great pattern to be fishing. A lot of the times the guides are going to use that as a very last resort. There's nothing wrong with doing it. Um, it catches fish for sure. It's there obviously there's eggs in the river. That is the thing that's happening for one reason or another. There is a bit of a, a stigma amongst the guides of trying to use natural insects or yes, more natural patterns that are imitating the natural insects than actually using um, an egg pattern. Guides do it, fishermen do it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. That's kind of where that San Juan worm lies is it's the San Juan worm is just one step away from using an egg pattern, but for some reason it doesn't have as much of a, uh, a negative kind of uh, viewpoint or, or a connotation with the guides type of thing. So absolutely. Um, and we're going to talk about fall too. And fall is very, very similar in that, um, you know, those rainbows begin to spawn in the, into that late winter um, and, and are kind of eating eggs and they're sitting in those, in those, um, in those gravel bars and on those reds. It's just something that we kind of skipped over it's not a lot of what the guides target during that time frame. We try and let those fish um, kind of spawn and do their thing. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, uh, no problem at all. Okay, cool. Yellowstone River in the spring, um, really cool. Now we've kind of come into the into a into a time frame where the Yellowstone's really starting to shine. Um, whereas before in the winter, we're just not really out there. Really, really great fishing to be had um, on the Yellowstone. As soon as that snow melts off, we, we don't have those ice on the banks and we can get those boats into those boat ramps. Off we go type of thing. Um, you know, springtime insects going to be very, very similar to kind of everything that we've talked about, which, which kind of makes everybody's life easier uh, as fishermen in this area, because it, especially when we're looking at these three rivers, a lot of a lot of the insects and a lot of what these fish are going to be feeding on are, are very, very similar. Um, you got your blooming to olives. We're going to start to get into some different mayfly patterns. Um, you've got your Mother's Day caddis, which we've kind of already talked about that spring kind, springtime caddis hatch that's happening. And then we've got our March Browns as well. Um, and kind of move forward from here. Um, Blue, here's some of the kind of main patterns that we're looking at. Um, 
you know, dry fly patterns are going to work really well. Blooming Dolive uh, kind of dries, and then kind of our standard um, kind of nymphs, Pat's rubber legs, uh, and then March brown nymphs. If we're going to kind of really focus on on that hatch, or we're seeing those happen. One thing that we kind of don't have a slide for for the Yellowstone in the spring is is the streamer fishing, um, and kind of that is truly one of the funner things to kind of focus on, especially out of the boat on the Yellowstone. Those those big fish have, have kind of been sitting there and they've slumbered all all winter long and, and um they're willing to move, they're willing to eat. Um a lot of a lot of the guides, especially if they're not working during that time frame, um, got days off and stuff like that, are going to really focus on getting the boats out there. Um, check out what's going on. Uh, what what changed through the winter? Or what's what's new in the Yellowstone? Because the Yellowstone changes every single year, um, and and do some and do some big streamer fishing. A lot of times we're just focused on the banks, um, casting in from the boat uh, to the bank and stripping streamers back. Um, just looking for a couple of those um, bigger fish uh, to kind of feed for us there. All right, cool. Yellowstone during high water has its moments it, it it will come up and it'll go down in terms of cfs there's times it, during its runoff that it, it is fishable and we can see some really great days of fishing out there for the most part when the yellowstone runs off it, it runs off really big it's a freestone river there's nothing holding that holding that water back um and it is known to get really really big big enough to wear on certain years on a, on a big high water year uh, it, it will be unfishable from the start of runoff whenever that will start, weather dependent and snow dependent, you know, all the way through into July. I've, I've seen it, uh, I think it was, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 years ago, where uh, the Yellowstone River was not fishable till in, into the middle of August. It was that big. Um, you'll get some cold weather that will come through. You'll get some days where the the CFS drops, the water levels drop enough, and there's clarity there where we can get back out on the water uh, for a day or two. But for the most part, when the Yellowstone runs off, if you're not kind of local or you're not uh, just kind of hanging out, waiting for your for your uh, kind of moment to get in there, it's just kind of unfishable until that drops enough to where we can kind of, um, you know, safely. A lot of it has to do with safety. This. Yellowstone gets big enough to where it's just very dangerous to even be running a boat down that river, especially uh, once we get from Livingston down east of Livingston, anything um, past Paradise Valley, downriver of Paradise Valley uh, is really fast. And it's a lot of big um, kind of things that we have to navigate and be very careful of. And a lot of a lot of people just won't do it for that for that reason. All right, so the next season that we're gonna talk about is summer. Um, this is this is kind of the height of the season, obviously for guides as well as fishermen, we have really nice weather. And this is where the majority of um, our insects are gonna really start hatching and kind of stay sustained throughout the summer, at least through that June, July, and somewhat into August timeframe. This is also where reading water starts to really change and it starts to get a little bit more technical and we have to start looking for um, different things when we go out and fishing and uh, not only from like water conditions to water temperatures uh, as well as other people um, fishing and being out, out on the river type of thing. So the first one we're going to address in the summer is the Gallatin River fishes really well all summer. Um, Super neat river to be out on in an act in a, just a ton of different insects that we'll see hatch through. This is where we're going to start to need to be more technical or more aware of, of what flies that we're seeing out on the river, meaning the natural insects that are out on the water. And we're going to need to try and do our best to actually imitate those and pick fly patterns that are going to be um that are going to that are going to work for for these different insects because these trout are going to begin to see these hatches and they're going to see see these different specific insects start to kind of move around and hatch and they'll they'll begin to key in 
on one particular thing um, as they begin to hatch. Uh, you know, for example, as we're kind of looking at this, uh, we'll see, let's take yellow, yellow sallies, stone, uh, yellow sallies, for example, yellow sallies is a small little stone fly that hatches for not necessarily a brief amount of time, um, but tends to hatch in a, in a kind of a, a one month time frame. And within that time frame, different waves come through. And as those waves of, the, of those insects are hatching, those fish will really, really key in on it. And for some reason or another, that's all they'll want is, is yellow sally nymphs or yellow sally, um, yellow sally dry flies if they're, if they're eating them off the surface type of thing. So this is where we need to be really aware. This is where, we, you know, they could be feeding on one particular pattern, let's say the yellow sally, and, and we're fishing a, a, a caddis nymph or something along that line. And we love that caddis nymph pattern and we've done really well with it over the years and, and we just don't understand um, why they won't touch it. And that's because they're keyed in on these specific insects. Um, we're just kind of touching here on, on the different things that hatch. This does a pretty good job of a hatch chart um, for our summer gallets and thing. Um, you've kind of got the main two big hatches, or the, the real main hatch of the year is that salmon fly hatch. And then following that is your golden stone. And then your other stone fly in there is your yellow sally. And you're gonna see all kinds of different things start to happen as well um, in terms of the different caddis and the different mayflies that are happening. And as we progress, um, through this summer is those, is those um, kind of, uh, for lack of a better term that I can't think of right now, those, those kind of river insects start to taper off. The fish are going to start to see those ants and those beetles and those grasshoppers uh, moving around and getting out in the water. And that's where we can kind of switch um, from, our, from our natural insects into our kind of terrestrial type insects. Some of the main patterns uh, here, we've kind of got our drake patterns um, and our ants and our grasshoppers and uh, your salmon flies and stuff like that. Um, there's, a, there's a ton of them. This is really hard to kind of go through every single uh, thing that we could see out there. Um, a lot of it comes down to just kind of getting out there and hanging out and, and seeing what's hatching and, and just trying to get in a feel for what's going on. And then even going into fly shops or doing internet research and, and trying to see what, see what um, different in, insects you saw that day and what's a good uh, thing to kind of imitate that. We're a great fly shop in that we're, we're very well known for giving out great information. Our guides sometimes hate us because our staff will, will spill the beans. We'll tell you exactly what's the hot pattern, exactly what ha what's hatching today or what hatched yesterday and, and how to go about it type of thing. And so we always tell beginner fishermen or, or, or folks that are from out of town that really don't know what's going on um, is coming to either our fly shop or somebody else's fly shop, but just ask. And a lot of times they're going to kind of give you those one, two, three top patterns or top insects to kind of be looking for. So as we are starting to find fish in the summer, things are going to really start to change. And this is where we need to kind of totally switch gears on what's going on. As those water temperatures kind of come up and um, our air temperatures as well, there is less oxygen in those slow pools, in those areas where those fish have been sitting through the winter as well as the, it, during the springtime. And trout need both cool water and oxygen. And so as that water temperature rises in these deeper pools, um, it begins to get too warm for these fish to sit in there as well as there's less as, as water temperatures come up in those pools, there's less oxygen in, in those in those pools and they just don't like it. So a lot of times we'll see these really great areas, uh, these big runs or these big pools that look just phenomenal, absolutely fishy, um, or we've been fishing them in the winter or we've been fishing them in the spring and that's where we'll be getting them. Um, we need to, again, very much switch gears. Uh, trout in the summer, especially on a sunny day, in the middle of the summer are gonna be sitting in fast, shallow, riffly water. And that's where the water temperatures are the coolest or the coldest, as well as there's 
there's the most oxygen in there. This is super beneficial for a fisherman or a guide that kind of knows what he's doing and, and what he's looking for because most people aren't um, targeting that type of water. It looks just too fast. It just does not look like fish would be holding in that water. Um, so if we, if we kind of look at this photo in this slide, we can see downriver of us kind of the big runoff and the big pool. For the most part, people will be focused on that and there's just not gonna be that many fish in there. It's not till when we move up into the head of this pool and into these boulders and into this, in this faster water where we're going to start to find these fish. And if we can, on a regular basis, just forget about the big pools and just start to look at the very, uh, just kind of indiscreet type of water, that very fast moving, very shallow water, water that you, you wouldn't even think a, a trout would sit in, let alone would move for your flies or even want to move out of that fast water. Um, the more you do it, the more you're going to kind of find that they're in there and it will happen. It was, it took me a couple of years of guiding and fishing to really get comfortable of really kind of looking at this, this is kind of crazy, crazy looking water, just super fast, maybe a foot deep in, in moving really quick and in no real feature other than that in it no no real break or no real boulder or no pool or anything like that they're just literally almost hanging out in no man's land and that's what they want it's what they want in the in the summertime during these these hot um days because it's what they need they truly don't have any choice i think they're probably getting tired in there but um i think they they feel like that's the only thing that they can possibly do so as we get into our summertime, as, as everybody local knows, that's when the crowds start to really get here. Um, we're going to see more fishermen. We're going to see rafters. We're going to see more boaters. We're just going to see a ton of stuff going on uh, in terms of recreation on the water, which is awesome. That's what the that's what people are here for, and that's what um, it's, it's a great great time of the year to be here. The more we can be adventurous out on these rivers, not only the Gallatin but any river. Um, that in the summer that's that's kind of fished regularly or, or highly pressured, which our rivers are getting more and more pressured, the better that we're going to do. Um, if we can cross the river, get to the other side, if we could use a trailhead to maybe hike an hour or so, you know, up and around something or down to the river um, and get into these areas where not only the guides, but um, local fishermen as well as um, fishermen from out of town or out of state, uh, are we're going to do a lot better. Even if we're targeting the right water with the right flies in the summer, these fish begin to get very, very wary of flies. They've been caught or they've seen their buddies get caught or uh, they're just, you know, spooky. They're very skittish in these very highly pressured areas in these areas where um, fishermen are, are hitting. So it was always fun for me uh, to be on the river, especially in the summer on my own, where I could really start to explore and I could kind of find these different areas where it just truly felt like um, not many people are, are fishing. And, and for the sake of this conversation, a lot, a lot of fishermen, uh, especially for out of town, are, are, are somewhat lazy. Uh, they want to hit that turnout and walk right down to the to the river and uh, hit that big pool that looks that looks like it. There's must be a million fish in there because it's slow moving, uh, and uh, and it just looks like uh, one of those um, you know spots we should be fishing. Uh, we want to try and do the opposite of that. We're gonna in the summer we're gonna look super fast water, um, especially on those sunny warm days, and and try and really get away from the crowds. Uh, we'll find too that the further we get away from the crowds and we start to pick the right water, the less our flies will matter in terms of um, kind of matching the hatch or having the exact right fly for that day because uh, those fish just haven't haven't been pressured. They haven't seen as many fishermen and they haven't seen as many flies and they're um, more willing to grab it for you. All right, Madison River, very similar to the Gallatin in regards to a lot of the flies or a lot of the hatches we're going to see, and again, that's a benefit for us in this area once we kind of get in tune to these seasons and in tune to these different um, 
kind of rivers and these different insects, we can begin to bounce around from river to river on a daily basis and kind of um, expect to see the same thing that I saw in the Gallatin. Uh, I expected to kind of, for the most part, be able to see it uh, the very next day on the Madison type of thing. Um, again, very similar flies. There's a ton of flies that go through the summer type of thing, ton of different insects that are starting to hatch. Um, golden stones, yellow sallies is your, is your kind of salmon fly uh, pattern as well as the salmon fly itself. Um, you got your caddis, you got your mayflies. And as we progress through uh, summer, we're gonna get into that terrestrial fishing that for those grasshoppers, those ants and those beetles. Um, some of the main kind of patterns here are, again, kind of beetles, mayfly nymphs, different mayfly dries, um, different kind of types of uh, emergers and stuff like that. That takes some time. That takes some um, kind of getting out on the water and kind of playing around with it and getting in fly shops. And a lot of, a lot of fly patterns that I found uh, is a competence thing. Um, I have a ton of patterns that I just absolutely love. I, I think they work phenomenal. Um, I rely very heavily on them. And, and one of my buddies or one of my fellow guides uh, doesn't like it. It's a fly that he doesn't have confidence in. He hasn't used it very much or, or the times that he did use it um, for one reason or another, he didn't do very well on it. And um, he, he just refuses to fish it anymore. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of, a lot of patterns, a lot of, of figuring out what, what you, what you want to fish comes down to, um, a little bit of experience doing well on those patterns and then, and then having confidence in it and fishing it well, um, knowing that you're kind of in the ballpark, knowing that it's, it's, you've caught fish on it in the past and, and there's no reason why you couldn't do it again type of thing. If we're kind of picking the right water and we're kind of, Kind of doing the things that we should be doing. Um, sometimes fly patterns really doesn't matter. It's you've you found fish that are potted up and you found them happy fish and they are willing to eat for you. Madison this summer, um, similar to the Gallatin River, it can be a little harder to read. It can be a little um, kind of harder to explain as well. Madison can look like one giant riffle or it is known as the hundred mile riffle. And for guys that see it for the first time or start to fish it for the very first time, it can be very intimidating because all you're seeing is moving water and you're not seeing a lot of um, breaks. or you're not seeing a lot of um, areas in the river where I, gosh, I don't even know where to start type of thing. One of the differences as a result, one of the differences for the Madison is it is moving faster and it is moving much more consistent than a river like the Gallatin is. The Gallatin has these breaks in it, it has these turns in it where these pools happen and, and, these, and these kind of features in the river change. Um, the Madison tends to have in most areas a main water channel that just kind of pushes through the river with boulders and stuff like that that, that tend to break it up. Because the river itself is moving so fast, um, fish will, which is somewhat different than on the Gallatin, fish will sit in the, in the slower water and the slower pools in the, in the breaks on the Madison, um, because they're, even though there, it is slower water for the Madison, there is enough oxygen and there is enough, um, cool water in there for them to sit. So we somewhat switch gears with, with the Madison in regards to, where we're going to start to look in the summer. We are starting to look, even though fish need fast water, we're going to start to look for what we kind of call holding water or the kind of breaks in the river. And it can be kind of, it's kind of hard to initially see when you first begin to kind of fish the Madison. There'll be these subtle, tiny little breaks or these subtle, tiny little seams. And then we have to start to begin to trust that they're not going to be sitting out in that main push, that main channel they're gonna to start to move into these kind of little little areas, these little kind of micro, micro seams, we call them, and these kind of little micro breaks, um, which honestly at times are only uh, maybe a foot wide by three feet long. 
and they're gonna, we gotta just kind of trust that, that they're gonna be sitting in there. The one thing that the Madison is known for, or the theory that I have, and a lot of other folks have too, the, the fish in the Madison tend to cycle. And what I mean by that is they will sit out in that heavy channel and that heavy main, main current um, for a period of time, maybe five to 10 minutes. And then they'll cycle in towards the bank or they'll cycle in towards that, that boulder or that little, that little break in the, in the river. And they'll sit in there for five to 10 minutes and then they'll move themselves back. And I think they're using that main channel is kind of that oxygen content and that cool water. And then they know that they can move in to that little bit of slower water, that seam um, to grab uh, food or take a rest. Um, it's beneficial to us in that the theory a lot of times is that even though we're staying in one area or we're continuously fishing, let's take an example, um, you know, a, a seam or a little pool that's maybe only three feet long by two feet wide, or, or maybe a little bit bigger for this example. If we fish it long enough and we kind of stay in there and we stay sneaky enough that new fret, we're gonna push fish out of that pool, but we're gonna also have fresh fish cycle in. Um, so the Madison is one of those places where we can kind of, we can kind of hang out in, in, in little areas. Um, maybe we move up upstream or downstream a tiny bit and let, um, that area we were just fishing kind of, uh, you know, um, rest a little bit, if you will. Um, but then a lot of times we can kind of move back into it and start catching fish again. All right, Madison River in the summer is heavily pressured. A lot of fishermen, a lot of people out there. Um, we're going to do best if we can move around, whether we have a boat and it's, it's covering water or if we're on foot, um, kind of trying to get off the beaten path, kind of get away from where other people are at, trying to find uh, fish that have been sitting in no man's land, meaning they're a mile or two down from a, um, you know, a heavily fished area and they're just not seeing as many fishermen. Yellowstone River in the summer, um, really great river very similar in how we're going to approach it, but it, it the physical makeup of it or, or the way that uh, it's going to appear is going to be a little bit different. The Yellowstone has these super long stretches of, uh, well, I keep talking, the, the um, flies, very similar. Again, we can kind of, uh, once we get in tune with what the uh, flies on the Gallatin, the Madison, and the Yellowstone are doing during the different seasons, we can kind of um, really start to uh, kind of jump from river to river and kind of use the same patterns and be successful, especially if you have confidence in those patterns. The Yellowstone is a very big river, and this is what I was kind of start to talk about. And there's stretches in, in areas of the river where it's just kind of big and it's wide and it's kind of very slow moving. And it can do that for a mile or two at a time. The one thing that we need to do when we fish the Yellowstone, this took me a very long time to figure out, um, is essentially literally ignore certain areas of the of, of the river. We're gonna we're gonna take that mile or two of very slow, deep moving water, and we're just gonna completely ignore it. Because same with the Gallatin and same with the Madison, trout in the summer need cold, fast water, and so we're gonna to start to look for these areas of the Yellowstone or within this certain stretches of the Yellowstone where we're gonna to start to see sharp turns or kind of big um, gravel bars. They're gonna break up that, that deep slow water and create kind of these inside riffles or these kind of super riffly like faster uh, moving stretches of river. And we're gonna really focus and target on that type of water. This took me forever to learn when I was guiding. I would go fish the Yellowstone and it, it took me so long to realize that um, I was just fishing. I was spending way too much time fishing uh, kind of water where literally, I mean, there could be no fish in there for a long, a long ways, a mile or two. 
um, because they've all congregated down into kind of that um, braided stretch of uh, what we're seeing here in this slide, that kind of braided stretch of river where we're going to start to get, um, you know, riffles and side channels and stuff like that, um, where these, where the water conditions are going to, you know, make them want to live, make them want to hang out in that area instead of sitting in that super, super slow um, type of water where it's just too warm, it's too slow, they don't, they don't like it at all. Um, fish in the Yellowstone, again, kind of similar to what we talked about, is best served out of a boat. Um, we do not offer a guided walkway trip on the Yellowstone River outside of the park. Um, it's just, it is it's a very big river. Um, very difficult for us to kind of, if we're going to use the concept of there's stretches or there's areas that we want to skip or ignore, then we're going to kind of, in a lot of ways, need a boat to be able to, um, you know, kind of move down the river and, and target uh, certain areas and then skip certain areas. Um, really good Yellowstone guides, I found out, again, it took me a very long time, will actually do just that. They will skip a mile to two miles of river in the boat. They will literally have, whether it's uh, friends or family or, or a guided client in the boat, they will literally have them sit down, reel, reel up and sit down, hang out, have a, have a snack or a bottle of water. And they will, they will forward row the boat through those stretches of river where it's just uh, very, what we call very swampy water or very kind of stagnant water um, so they can get down into another stretch where the water flows pick up and we're starting to see riffles um, in faster water where trout are going to be going to be sitting. Again, with the concept that um, the trout are just not going to be sitting in, in slow stagnant water when it when it comes to kind of summer type fishing. It's just not the water temps um, or water, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, levels that they're going to want to be sitting in type of all right, so now we get into fall fishing. Uh, things are starting to change. We've kind of gone through a lot of our main summer hatches, um, and we're starting to get into some some specific fall bugs, but more so a change of weather and change of water conditions and where these fish are going to be starting to um, to kind of hang out in type of thing. They're going to essentially start to move out of their kind of summer fast water. And when we start to get these cooler um, days and these kind of cooler nights, they're going to start to move back into what we talked about uh, in the winter and then the springtime, which is kind of that slower, um, more um, kind of deeper water type of thing where they don't have to work as hard. Now that the water temperatures are starting to drop, those, sl those um, slower, deeper pools are starting to get to be cool enough um, where they, they can kind of be happy and sit in there, as well as oxygen levels are starting to um, kind of be right for them as well. Insects in the fall, somewhat similar to what we talked about in the winter, we're kind of starting to get back into just kind of some main bugs, um, which is kind of your midges, uh, stonefly still cruising around, and then your, your blooming dollops and, and your kind of different mayfly patterns. Um, as well as, as spawning browns in the fall. And we can kind of start to think about egg patterns. We can kind of think about worms, San Juan worms, um, as well as streamer patterns as well uh, as, those, as those browns begin to spawn and they begin to get more aggressive if that's, if that's kind of something that we want to kind of work and target. Or if we're in an area or we're in a part of a river or a specific river, um, mainly rivers up here in regards to kind of fish moving out of Hebgen Lake or Earthquake Lake um, to kind of get into their fall spawn. And that is definitely a, a really popular thing and a really fun thing um, to do during that time frame. Pat's rubber legs, phenomenal. Um, we're gonna start to, again, kind of get into our kind of uh, wintry type bugs, um, our kind of very generic um, kind of confidence flies, our, our, our you know, little flashy midges or San Juan worms, um, as well as if we're starting to see some um, insects hatching. If it's going to be, you're going to see fish feeding, it's going to be on midges or blooming dollops typically in the fall. There is a little bit of caddis action that happens, um, but for the most part, it's kind of straightforward. 
Um, I kind of already talked about it a little bit. Reading the water, there's as those temperatures start to change, start to back into that late fall. Um, we're going to start to kind of get our winter mindset back, which is fish not wanting to work super hard in the currents, starting to want to um, kind of hang out in those pools and those easy areas where they still have water flow, they still have oxygen, and it's good uh, temperatures for them, uh, but it's still enough current um, for them to have a food source, have insects being kind of moved on river to them. All right. Um, Fall fishing, again, our crowds are starting to kind of uh, thin out. We can start to, in certain ways, think about fishing some of those uh, obvious spots again, some of those spots where, you know, maybe they've been fished heavily throughout the, throughout the summer. It's a touristy spot or it's a guide, it's a popular guide spot or something like that. Um, but that's all died down. Maybe there's been some time, two, three weeks or so, where uh, in between that happening and when we're, when we're getting out on the water, we can kind of start to concentrate on those more uh, popular areas just because they're not getting fished quite as much. Uh, Madison River in the fall, kind of similar to what we talked about. Um, kind of got your your main uh, insects here that we've, that we've talked about this whole time. You still got some stoneflies in the river, midges, um, your blooming dogs, your mayflies. There's certain years where terrestrial fishing, and we kind of talked about that, um, your hoppers, your ants, your beetles will extend into the fall, even though it's cold enough um, where we're just not seeing those on the banks anymore and those fish really aren't seeing them anymore on the river. Um, we can still at times fish hoppers. Um, two years ago, that, that hopper bite, that hopper uh season went really really late we still had guides fishing it and doing really really well on them um well into late september and, and even in october um still fishing just a, a very normal hopper pattern not even a um you know kind of a generic one um but an actual hopper pattern getting fish to eat it all right, Sim similar Madison, we kind of already talked about kind of winter on the Madison, and we're going to start to do that in the fall. Um, those fish are going to start to move back out of that fast water and start to move back into that slower water and into that holding water. Um, the one thing about kind of different from the Gallatin in the fall and the Madison in the fall is the Madison is a very popular fishing spot in the fall. It still kind of holds fishermen. People still want to be there. A lot of that is because of that fall brown spawning activity. Um, fish moving up out of, have, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, fish moving up out of Ennis Lake as well as um, Hebgen Lake and Earthquake Lake will keep fishermen there. So we do need to continue on the mass and to kind of work a little bit and try to get off the beaten path. Um, be aware of where other fishermen are when you're actually fishing or trying to find new spots or, or using kind of your sneaky spots to get away from guys that maybe again are just fishing a boat ramp or fishing a, a major main access point. Yellowstone River in the fall, phenomenal time of the year to be out on the Yellowstone. Um, a lot of times now our water levels, if it's a big runoff year, are, are about perfect. Um, and we can begin to really fish the Yellowstone um, in kind of those obvious spots. We can start to see the riffles a little bit easier um, because there's not as much water coming through there. We can kind of see those pools a little bit easier because those um, pools have developed a little bit more. Um, sometimes it, it takes a while for the Yellowstone River to kind of not be fishable, but to be able to see where you want to actually fish because sometimes it can just be so big. There's a giant sheet of water um, kind of covering all of these features, even though there's fish down there and holding in there. Um, great streamer time of the year. Um, again, browns are starting to spawn. They're starting to get aggressive. Um, it's one of those things the guides love doing. Local fishermen love going to do. We're going to start to see less pressure on the Yellowstone in the fall because it, it's primarily a float river. So there's not as many main weight access points or points for us to, um, you know, kind of run across a whole groups of weight fishermen or, or people just kind of recreational um, fishing on foot. You just really don't see that all that much. 
so that's a really neat thing. Similar again, kind of what we talked about, still same insects kind of on all three rivers. Um, you got your fall caddis, still some blue and olive mayflies hatching. Um, similar to the Madison in the fall, hopper fishing grasshoppers can still be really, really good late into the season. And your midges. Um, Kind of same thing, main kind of patterns that we're going to use. Uh, we can use them on all three of these different rivers, which is really cool. Um, I just kind of talked about this as those water level drops when we get into fall. Um, the holding water starts to get more obvious for the fishermen. It starts to be way easier for us to see. Um, and we kind of have an idea of what they're looking for, where they're going to want to be holding, because we're going to kind of use that concept of um, the kind of uh, cooler cooler days, cooler water temps, fish are going to start to move out of that fast water and start to kind of set into um, those slower pools, those slower moving uh, areas and start to pot up again and start to get ready for uh, winter type of thing. And I kind of just talked about this as well. Um, you're going to see less people out there. And then we did chat about um, streamer fishing in the fall. And on both the Madison as well as the Yellowstone. And lots of really great streamer patterns out there. Um, streamer fishing can be difficult to do on foot. It's something that's best done out of the boat. Not that it can't be done out of the foot, but the on foot. But the idea behind streamer fishing, especially on a river like the Yellowstone or the Madison, um, we're not trying to catch a bunch of fish. We're trying to catch a couple big ones. And a lot of times the best game plan for that is to cover a lot of water. And the, and the best way for us to do that is to use the boat, um, kind of, again, casting in towards the bank, stripping those streamers back at us. Uh, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Again, we're just trying to cover a ton of water and we're trying to, trying to find one or two of these big fish that are willing to eat one of these really big flies. Um, doesn't happen consistently sometimes we'll run into a, a really great streamer day where we're getting bites all the time we're getting fish chasing flies and it's just action kind of non-stop um but if we're going to kind of streamer fish on a regular basis we've got to kind of look at it like we're hunting for big fish and we kind of really can't um expect a ton to happen throughout the day it could be a lot of work. Uh, very rewarding, though. That's how a lot of these big fish in this area are caught. Um, next slide is we're just kind of talking. We've talked about some very specific or somewhat specific types of insects, somewhat specific types of patterns. I started to talk a little bit about confidence patterns, patterns that uh, we found through experience that work well for us year round. And, and we can, and we can use these year round uh, if we've gained confidence in them, and it's something that we enjoy fishing or or, or we know is going to work. Um, some of these will work year round. The Pertagon pattern here for the last three years or four years is one that we began to rely really, really heavily on, um, and we have found that year round, this thing can be just a utility knife of a fly pattern. It's one of those patterns where we can kind of ignore what's hatching, ignore what's happening around us, fish it with confidence, and um, actually catch fish on it while fish are seemingly being picky or being keyed in on other flies. There's a lot of these generic patterns out there. Um, you know, during this kind of quick presentation, I kind of, I floated over some fly patterns um and it's very hard for us to just kind of lay them out there because there's so many of them as a beginning fisherman or somebody maybe that's in a different river or that they don't fish on a regular basis or they're just trying to figure things out a lot of these classic fly patterns patterns that have been along for around for a really really long time um work and they work really really well and they can work year round for you and, and kind of patterns that i'm talking about are um you know kind of the copper john or your classic pheasant tail nymph or your classic kind of prince nymph or brassies um you know a lot of a lot of patterns that are 
that are overlooked these days because of uh, they're not as techy or they're not as um, you know kind of used by the younger generations of fishermen or something like that. They're just in certain ways um, in some fishing circles somewhat have gotten um, kind of looked over or kind of forgotten about type of thing. And it's a great place for us to start. Here's here, uh, another really good one. Here's here, all these patterns that I'm kind of um, listing here have been designed or, or used um, as a do-all, as a, as, a, as a mayfly pattern that is close enough that could work for just about any mayfly hatch out there um, if, if we're kind of getting the size right. Um, type of thing. So I've had phenomenal days uh, just on a prince nymph or a pheasant tail nymph or a hare's ear nymph. Um, when fish were feeding very specifically on a, let's say a green drake uh, nymph or something like that. And, you know, the first inclination for a lot of fishermen is, oh, I need a green drake pattern. Um, for And that's great. That can work really, really well at times. Um, but if somebody who's maybe guessing or doesn't really understand what they're seeing out on the water, these classic generic flies are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Pertagon, again, is one of these European nymphs that we've uh, started to rely really, really heavily on the last three or four years. Um, and this Chubby Chernobyl is up here. Chubby Chernobyl is awesome in a, from a terrestrial standpoint. It works really great for a grasshopper pattern or an ant or a beetle, um, any of these big kind of uh, uh, terrestrial type insects that get out on the river. Um, and our fish in this area tend to, uh, even though they're not seeing hoppers or natural terrestrials out on the water, you know, they can come up there and grab that thing. Uh, no problem. They work really great for a dry dropper as well. They're kind of like a big indicator too. We can put a nymph uh, underneath there. All right. I know that was a lot of information. My last slide is just get out there and go fishing. Um, I kind of just touched on it. At times, it's not about being perfect. It's not about knowing exactly what insects out there. It's not about um, having all this knowledge. It's about picking some flies and getting out on the water using um, the background you have or the knowledge that you have in, in trying to do your best with it and then um, gaining on it, you know, using every day and trying to retain what you're seeing, trying to understand what you're seeing. Um, you do this long enough, eventually you're going to begin to, you know, be able to fall back on these different things you've learned and kind of these little nuances and these different things that seem to work well for you as a fisherman. Um, you know, again, going back to, uh, you know, fly patterns that I really love that maybe a, a really good friend of mine doesn't love. Um, similar things to here. There's little things that you're going to pick up that seem to do well for you in that river and that season during that that particular hatch, that particular insect that's hatching, you seem to kind of, it works for you. Yet I could tell a buddy of mine and it would never work for him, whether it's because he doesn't have confidence in it or he's not doing it the same way that you're doing it. Um, it's just one of those things. So much of this comes down to just getting out there, having fun with it, don't judging yourself or judging your days by how many fish you caught or not how many fish you caught. Um, but just trying to, again, um, you know, use everything you got to kind of gain some experience, gain some knowledge uh, of what you're doing out on the water. I know that was a ton of information and a very little bit of all the time. Uh, that is all I got right there. You did great. I, um, I must admit, I am very new at fly fishing. My husband is, he fly fishes and he ties some flies, but um, I feel like I learned a lot <laughs> and there aren't any questions right now, but I have some um, tie-in questions to the book since it is a book-based program that we're uh, doing as a tie-in event. So if you don't mind, I will, um, there's two specific flies that I want to ask you about. Yeah. Um, the first one is a girdle bug. Do you know that? pattern and and what would you use it for or when would you use it yeah. it's called a girdle bug it was mentioned in the book yeah i wasn't sure yeah, yeah. oh okay y yes uh the girdle bug okay so the girdle bug is a stonefly pattern okay and we talked a lot about stoneflies and it is um it's basically another name for the pat's rubber legs um the similar to 
who kind of was talking about Copper Johns and like all these old classic patterns. The girdle bug was one of the very first stonefly patterns that was kind of tied. It's one of those classic, like kind of old school, old timer type stonefly patterns. We still carry them. In fact, I just got a whole bunch of new ones in here. Uh, they're sitting right next to me right now to, to fill our fly bins up with. Um, stonefly patterns, uh, and I'll be kind of really brief about this, especially the girdle bug and the Pat's rubber legs. You saw it in these slides, and for you guys that are watching this, work darn near year round. Um, if you don't know what's going on uh, and you're going to go out fishing and, and nymphing, um, you would be hard pressed to not throw on a girdle bug or a Pat's rubber legs in a uh, pheasant tail or a copper john or something like that and, and actually do well. We rely so much on the, that, Pat's, that stonefly, that Pat's rubber legs or that girdle bug. There's literally like the month of August, maybe September is kind of the only two months out of the entire year um, where that's not really used on a regular basis. The other 10 months out of the year, literally that's all, that's one of those ones where you could you could tie in every day and probably do okay. Okay. Um, and the second one, the book we're reading as a Belgrade community is The Royal Wolf Murders. What, yeah, great, yeah, good book. It's, yeah, it's great. I um, I read it twice. Um, oh, and then actually, there's a follow up from about the girdle bug. Tim says it's called a girdle bug because guys used the rubber from their wife's girdles to make the rubber legs. Nice. <laughs> right, right. I didn't know Very that. Thanks, nice, Tim. That. Thank you. Um, and then, so the royal wolf. It's a. I know. I did a little bit of research because I was like, is it even? It is a real fly. Um, no. But it's not meant to look like anything, is what I read. It was. It's called a an attractor. Is that right? Yeah, it's a attractor okay. pattern. It's kind of again. It's kind of similar to what we were talking about with generic flies. Okay. Um, yeah, it's an attractor pattern. It's made to look like a, a mayfly or a caddis, or even just a, a dry, a, just a dry, just a dry fly. Just a hey, look at me, come eat me type of thing. Okay, so it kind of sits on top of the water, and that's what a dry fly means. It doesn't get really wet. Yeah. It's kind of, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, okay, so then I have um, I have a section of this book I actually want to read, because to me, it sounds like uh, I don't know what it means. I honestly, I like, I had, I had to read it a few times, and even now I'm like, okay, I think I get a little bit of the idea. Um Okay, this is uh, someone, the main character, Sean Stranahan, is helping a potential um, person he's going to make art for, actually, f uh, fish a river. And it's over the phone, he's giving him this advice. So he says, here's what you do. Put on a size 14 elk hair with a greased sparkle pupa on the dropper. Pick all the pockets, keep wading upstream, <laughs> never make the same cast twice. The trick with a dry caddis is covering lots of river. Later, when you start to see trout stick their noses out of the water, clip off the elk hair and tie on a soft hackle, leave the pupa on the dropper and work back downstream. Swinging the flies in the current seams, the slower parts of the riffles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Explain that whole thing to you. You mean? I just mean like, does it make sense to you? Because, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it does. Oh. Yeah, it does. He fish. Those are good books. He fishes. He um, does fish. Yes. So yeah. it, for people who don't know, Keith McCafferty, he wrote for Fish and Stream or Field and Stream rather, um, and he lives in Bozeman. He fishes every chance he can. So he yeah. knows the rivers and he knows um, the things that are happening, but. As someone who fishes, talking to someone who does not fish, what, it is actually yeah. terminology you would use together, maybe, like it talking is. to other fishermen. It, it is, actually. Awesome. Um, it is. I was trying to find, there's so many photos in here. Yeah. <laughs> that cabin that he talks about, I've read all of his books. It's been oh. a long that's the first one, right? The Royal the, Wolf. The Royal Wolf is the first one. Yeah. yeah. He talks about that. Um, Oh God, what is it? That little fishing uh, club that they have, right? And they have a cabin right on the Madison. Is that correct? Yeah, um, the club doesn't come into the second one, but oh, okay. uh, 
that's yeah, a real club. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I wondered if I had a photo of it in here, but that's why I started going through slides. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, they, he they, he he's describing a real place on the Madison. It's yeah. Just oh, absolutely. Yeah. The bridge. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. pretty cool. Cool. Um, and then I have oh um, there's a question from Michelle, and uh, a, another tie-in question to the book. Um, one of the plot points is that uh, the one of the main characters is asking Sean Stranahan to find a fish that her dad caught. Um, so we want to know, do rainbow trout really come back to the same spots that they're caught in year after year? Like, do they keep, do they live for a few years and do they go back to the same spots? And if they're tagged, the fish in this book that he, Sean's trying to recatch have a, a notch cut out of their um, top fin in the, like right near the base. So it looks like a yeah. little V cut out. So do they actually come back? And then could you possibly catch the same fish if you tagged it that way? Or do, does it not work that way? <laughs> yeah, it's possible, probably highly unlikely. <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, yes and no, yes and no. I've, I've, I've kind of heard that, or I've had that, I've heard that question about it. Um, the one thing that I can say or that I can touch on that by experience is I think the trout, like let's take the Madison River, for example, move more further upriver or downriver um, than most people think or than I initially than I initially thought, if that makes sense. I used to think that, um, you know, the fish will tend to stay in like maybe one long stretch of river or like one 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 mile stretch or two miles or something like that and, and that'll be the kind of their home or that'll be their you know kind of area they'll spend the majority of their life in i began to um kind of think opposite on that especially from my experience of when these fish start to really move around for their spawns um it's kind of hard for me to describe or get into detail on it but i now think that when these fish spawn even even if they don't leave the river and they go or i'm sorry even if they're um if they stay in the river, meaning they're not coming out of a lake and moving up into a into one of these rivers, um, that they'll actually travel, I don't know, like 15, 20, even 30 miles. Wow. So my theory is we have a theory that fish from Ennis, the town of Ennis or Ennis Lake, will move all the way up into the upper part of the valley to, to spawn. Wow. Yeah. That's quite a ways good for it is quite a ways it is quite a ways and i used to think it's impossible or mm -hmm. what possible i now think it's 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 actually i i think for sure i'm like 100 percent that it's happening that they're that's, going that's really cool okay. <laughs> yeah. um so i have um i guess two more questions but if anyone else has any questions feel free to raise your hand or, or type them in the chat. We only have a few more minutes left and I want to respect everybody's time, but I'm enjoying the conversation. So um, is it typical for uh, every fly tire to have a signature flare for their ties? Um, another character in the book um, would add a tiny gold thread to all of the tie, the flies that he ties um, yeah. and I wasn't sure if that's actually legitimate or if that kind of defeats the purpose of all the different patterns because fish like especially gold like I feel like that reflects differently on the surface and I don't know it uh makes the pattern different than what it was intended to be and I wasn't sure if you had any thoughts on signatures for their for flies <laughs> I would say it's not typical because you want it you kind of nailed it it's okay. it, it would <laughs> If you if you put a gold thread on every uh, pattern you tied, then if we were you know trying to really imitate something, then um, you know it would it wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be correct, right? Um, but with that being said, uh, tires do have uh, their own styles and their own way of doing things, and there's a lot of um, tires where there it's kind of hard to describe, but the the way they tie them or the things that they introduce into the into the patterns that they make up are very, very, uh, it's very similar, right? It's the type of thing that I can look at and kind of know a certain fly came from a certain guy because it's just the, the things that are in it the way that it's tied. Okay, yeah. So not the same thing, not a gold thread every time, but like a 
something similar. A style or a, or a similarity between all of them. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. And then in the book again, there, they do some fly fishing on lakes. And I know this, I asked you to talk about the rivers, but do you have a really quick, uh, explanation or maybe like just here's the top two differences between fishing a river and a lake besides obviously the river's moving and like would you fly fish a, a lake in reality it, yeah okay yeah absolutely yeah hebgen lake and earthquake lake especially okay. uh, phenomenal still water trout fishers i mean some of the best trout fishing lakes i mean i in around for sure um especially probably in the country. Um, totally different, totally different mindset. Uh, in the river, for the most part, the fish for this conversation aren't moving. The river's moving. In the lake, the water is not moving, but the fish are always moving type of thing. Okay, to get that oxygen. <laughs> to get, yes, and to get that food source and stuff right. like that, right? Um, so yeah, totally different mindset. The lake, lakes are really cool though. Yeah. Uh, so you it's called it still water? Is that what you called it? Still water yeah, trout fishing? Yeah, still water for okay. sure. Yeah, still water, or it's just another word for a lake. Yeah. Uh, I used to guide the lakes a little bit. Have been, I'd get a couple of years or a couple of days out every year, um, and then Quake Lake as well. And I was always really excited to do it. It was a, it's a totally different world, um, and it was always a, a really fun, neat experience. And uh, I was always really, really excited about it. And I always wanted to learn more about them and how yeah. to. Fish better but never got enough time out on them um to figure it out uh on this on this subject we started offering ice fishing trips out on hebgen cool a couple of our guides like three years ago got really into it and they had to figure it out and learn it and so they fished it on their own like every day all winter and then um yeah we just started doing guided trips out there the last two years and uh, people are digging it. They're having a lot of fun. That it's sounds really fun. I fishing. It's just regular ice fishing. Right. Uh, but if you don't have the gear and you can borrow the gear from you guys, like yeah. that's even better. Right? It is. They're having, it's been, it's been like really popular, especially this winter. Very cool. Um, okay. And then final question, um, yep. unless there's another one from the audience, but I'm curious uh, if you have any favorite gear recommendations. I know it's probably like such a loaded question, especially having um, the guide and, and being an outfitter, but is there something that you will always buy um, or something like that? Like, I guess I could phrase it that way. Like when you fish, what do you fish with? In term, uh, do you mean like in terms of brands? Um, yeah, yeah, or I don't know. Um, yeah, brands or your favorite flies um that work really well for you the ones that you mentioned that might not work well for others but you yeah. always have success with and yeah. then yeah and then have you ever fished so two part i guess have you ever fished with something called a split bamboo rod um because that's in the book too i was like oh i wonder how how frequently those are used now <laughs> They're, they're not used frequently at I, all. Yeah, I didn't think so. Super cool. They are, bamboo rods are really, really neat. Um, old, very kind of old school, um, classic dry fly, dry fly fishing, fly fishing rod, right? Okay. They're, they're very, they're, they're not a very good, they're not a very dual purpose type rod, meaning they're built for like one thing and one thing only. Um, they're pretty, they're very, they're delicate. Um, they are very, very neat. Uh, I do own one. It was a gift to me. And I've literally fished it one time and then put it back in its case because uh, A, it was a gift. It was, they're very, they're, it was, it's a very special one. And um, it's just like something that I don't, I'm afraid I'm going to break it or something like that, you know? Uh, it's yeah. just those rods. Um, they are, they're, just to touch on that really fast, there's like a whole, there's a, they're, they're very niche. There's a whole group of guys that collect them, love them. Like that's their thing. Um, and they can be very, very, very expensive, like insanely expensive, like a uh, 10,000, $20,000, a rod type of expensive. If they were made by the right rod builder, they're, they're typically always handmade. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, I, I wouldn't even know because I don't know much about it. I do know there were like some main rod builders back in the day, guys that 
you know, main names of guys that were doing it and they don't do it anymore. Or they passed on or, or so on and so forth. And those are like highly sought after rods by collectors. Um, yeah. We have one in the shop. It, we had it here for like three years. We haven't sold it to anybody. All right, everybody. Galaxy then, Guides has one bamboo. One bamboo rod. <laughs> one it's, a bamboo rod left. It's, a, it's a Winston. It's a really nice one. Uh, <laughs> it's really expensive. Uh, yeah. you can buy it if you want. I and then, yeah, back to your gear. Yourself. Yeah, yeah back you... to gear. I think the best way to answer that is to um, the is in kind of a broad term in that the most common rod that is used in our area is what you it's it's called a nine foot five weight rod. Okay? okay, it's nine feet long, and the weight of it, the like how they. Um, Oh, how they uh, kind of like uh, characterize the rods, the the stiffness or the kind of heaviness of the rod is by weights, right? So zero being the lightest weight, uh, 12 being the heaviest weight. Uh, a nine foot five weight is the most commonly used rod. You cannot go wrong with it in this, in this area. It'll work well in the Gallatin. It'll work well in the Madison, the Yellowstone. It can work. It'll work well for dry flies, nymph fishing, as well as streamer fishing type of thing. So if you were to buy one rod, it'd be a nine foot five weight rod. All right. To touch on that really fast, fly rods from the pop, the main brands are expensive, um, but they can be worth it. If it's something that you really enjoy doing and it's something that you can see yourself doing for a long time, I would... I know nine hundred dollars for a, one fly rod is a lot of money, but it 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 can be worth it. You don't need that gear though. Is is kind of it's because it's kind of a dual dual point. Uh, we can go out and fish just as well. A good fisherman can go out and fish just as well with a hundred dollar setup than a three thousand dollar setup. That's all there is to it. Yeah. The best of the expensive stuff is typically it's it has it's under warranty and has a lifetime warranty and then no questions asked warranty i can't tell you how many rods my dog has chewed or um I've, I've run over with the boat or whatever and you send them back and they'll send you a new one for like 70 bucks so that's the one thing that you got going for you yeah that's a benefit yeah it is a, it is a benefit it really is when you do silly stuff yes for sure Okay. Well, thank you, Mike, for joining us, for sharing your expertise. I, I really appreciate uh, the presentation and learning all about fly fishing much, much more than I ever thought I would know about fly fishing. <laughs> um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. Our next um, event is the 4th of March, um, and that is based on, let me remember, oh, it's the... Um, our, the special collections librarian actually from Montana State University Bozeman Library. He is a librarian angler and he has fly fished on six continents. So he's going to tell some stories and talk to you about how to access the trout and salmonid archives at MSU Bozeman and that can be accessed from home even. So he'll kind of walk you through that um, just as a little plug. So the drawing for those prizes I mentioned will be on April 1st. If you attend the remaining events for, for the series, you'll get another entry per event. So um, keep joining us and learning more about uh, everything that is related to the Royal Wolf murders. And we hope to see you soon. So Mike, thank you so much. I uh, hope yeah. everybody has a great night and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.